Okay, thank you. Um, Bev Davis, superintendent from Orleans Central Supervisory Union. Thank you for joining us. And can you give us an update on your community in progress? Sure. So, you know, I had some things all prepared and I don't want to repeat what other people have said. So I'm going to try to um, shift a little bit. But as a reminder, um, Orleans Central is in the Northeast Kingdom. We have six K through eight schools, uh, high school and a union preschool, of about 1100 students. So we started our planning back in the beginning of June and we surveyed staff, we surveyed parents, we asked staff um, what their needs were, what their needs were around professional development, around planning, um, and what they needed to feel comfortable returning to in-person teaching. And we asked parents if they could give us in a, an early idea of whether or not they preferred in-person or remote learning, what conditions they wanted met for their children to return in person. Um, and we asked if they were planning to access busing. So we got those survey results, we analyzed those. We had some days with staff at the end of the school year to start some initial planning. We put some protocols in place. And even though we didn't have the health and safety guidance before staff left for the summer, we had some ideas of what would be included. And we asked staff to start problem solving on ways that we could address some of that. We, we had some decisions to make early on and as soon as the health and safety guidance came out, we were able to make those decisions. So that was really important. One of them was how we were gonna handle busing. So when we found out that busing could start in step three, so basically all the kids could ride the bus, we didn't have to worry about spacing, um, and that kids would need health checks on the bus, that was good information. And then we had to decide how those health checks would take place. If we had to hire bus monitors, you know, this took hours and hours and hours of conversation. Hiring a bus monitor, if we could even find bus monitors, how long would, but how much longer would each route take? And our bus company was estimating at least twice as long. So while wow, that, that has a significant impact. Um, what are you gonna do with a little five-year-old who doesn't pass the health check on the bus and the parents have already left and they're home with a 10-year-old sibling? And, and what happens if a bus monitor doesn't show up one morning and um, does that bus not run that day? So ultimately we decided and we worked um, regionally with, with this decision to have um, parents do the daily health checks, fill out a ticket, that they present to the bus driver. And once we had that figured out, now we could start to think about school. And so the other piece of it was, was there room in our schools to bring all the kids back? And so we went to work measuring all the spaces in our schools and we quickly determined that at the pre-K through eight level, we definitely had room to bring all the students back five days a week for in-person instruction. So that was really good news. Um, the high school determined they, they did not have anywhere near the space to bring all the kids back. So our reopening plan is that we are offering um, five day a week instruction for all pre-K through eighth graders. Our high school is operating a hybrid model. They'll have 50% of the kids in two days a week, 50% of them in the, another two days a week and all the kids remote one day for uh, to allow for a full deep cleaning. At the same time, we put out another survey to parents and asked them to really make a commitment. We did decide we would offer a full remote option for those people who were not comfortable sending their kids to in-person instruction. And we had hoped that we would mitigate the exodus to, to home study and maybe be able to, to keep some of those kids and we also thought it would be a nice option to be able to offer our staff who had real concerns about returning to in-person teaching if we could offer them a remote teaching option. The results of that survey were that 77% of families want in-person instruction, um, about 15% want remote option, and then we did lose, I think it's another 8% to home study. Um, so, 
um, that's where we're at now. We put out an application to teachers uh, to be a remote teacher. We only had a handful of teachers apply for that. So we're currently figuring out what that online instruction will look like. Uh, we have, you know, we're, our K-8 schools are not that large. For returning in person, anywhere from 50% at our, uh, 50 students in our smallest school to about 140 in our largest K-8 school. And we have about 100 students K-8 offering remote who have chosen. So we are trying in the process of organizing that remote school. A couple of my principals have volunteered to be principals of the remote school while at the same time managing their in-person school. They'll work with their remote remote staff to figure out the schedule and, and all the protocols around the remote teaching. We've one early challenge I had was my K through eight principals don't have year-round contracts. So they're not paid to work in the summer. I asked the board for permission to pay them. There was a lot of reluctance to do that. Um, it was ultimately, I got permission to pay them for 10 days, but it was not unanimous. So that's been a real struggle, not having access to administrators during this time. Um, it's been hard for parents. They've been calling the school. There's nobody there. There's nobody working there because they're not contracted to work in the summer. So that's been a challenge. I know that they're putting in hundreds of hours and not getting paid. Um, and that doesn't feel great to me. We have, we've done informational, virtual informational meetings to staff. We're trying to keep the communication going. Um, I'm sending out emails, doing school messenger calls, not making assumptions that staff are necessarily checking their work email in the summer. So try to put out a, an all call to let them know if something important is coming their way. We're working closely with our association. Um, the association president has been involved in all of the planning meetings. We are, are working through things. She's bringing concerns to our planning group and we're trying to um, you know, be respectful of all the different anxiety levels that are out there and trying to come up with things to mitigate that as best we can. We, um, much as um, Lynn Coda mentioned, our regional superintendents group meets regularly. Uh, for a while, we were meeting three times a week. We're now meeting once a week, but we're certainly in contact pretty much daily. Um, I think nobody's mentioned that Secretary French has done weekly calls with superintendents. That's been really important for the lines of keeping the lines of communication open. It gives us all a chance to ask questions and all kind of hear um, the answers to those questions all at once. We've, um, we've been meeting with different groups of teachers. So in our small schools, we have a number of shared employees and there's definitely high anxiety around them about being in different schools. You know, we have art teachers who are in four different schools during a week. So what do we need to do? What kind of scheduling changes can we make? How can we, this is our chance to, to reimagine education. What does that look like? How do we keep our employees safe um, so that they aren't being exposed to all those schools? And at the same time, to think about, um, you know, what, what kinds of scheduling can we do? Um, how will it be delivered? And if we have to shift to all remote, you know, the teacher who has 500 kids in, in four different schools, when they're trying to keep up with those kids in an all remote setting, it's unmanageable. It's, it's unreasonable. We can't ask that. So we're trying to pay attention to that. We are, we've met with those teachers. We've included them in um, having a say in that. I'm look, trying to look at my other big things. A, a concern is um, the aid, the money that was set aside for HVAC grants and working with Efficiency Vermont. We're on that. We've applied, but nothing, no work has been able to be started because the grant documents have not been released yet to Efficiency Vermont. So there's a hold up there. So the question of trying to get that work done even before September 8th is concerning. 
So that will be, that will be we, we're going to want to hear from you on that. Um, certainly uh, concern about the ADM and how can we hold harmless, even though we have offered our full remote option, hoping that would help some families with that. We have 61 students who have opted for home study. So that's going to be a huge hit uh, to our small schools. Another um, immediate question that I need a challenge, I need to come up with a solution to is, our students were scheduled to start on August 24th, meaning they were going to be in school 10 days before Labor Day. So if we get a waiver of, for five of the required student days down to 170 days, that still leaves us with five days that we're gonna have to figure out if we're shifting our whole calendar, um, if we're going to try to bargain with employees to add five days and pay them, obviously their per diem for those five days. Um, and I know that if it's for planning purposes, we could use ESSER money. Um, and I think I saw a question, could ESSER money be used to pay administrators? And yes, it, we have just gotten that, that guidance about allowable uses and we could pay them for that time as well. Um, so the calendar issue, it is a little bit stickier for us just because we had those 10 student days before September 8th. So I need to think through that and, and, and people need to know right now, like, what does that look like? What, what is the final decision? Um, I'm kind of waiting for the final governor's written directive to come out to see what's in there. And then we'll, we'll work on it that way. Um, I think, you know, the health and safety things, like I said, we figured out that we can do uh, the six feet distancing and have room for all our kids to come back. And now that all our kids aren't coming back in person, we have even more room. Our association expressed a lot of concern with the idea of um, going down to a three foot distancing. So we will, since we can do the six feet, that's what we'll plan to go, through, you know, go forward with that. Even if the guidance gets updated, you know, there's no reason not to continue with the six feet as long as we have the capacity to do so. We do have this, the staffing concerns. I, you know, I've heard multiple people mention staffing concerns. Will we actually have enough staff to reopen? We, because we're offering five day a week in person and regionally um, our, our bordering supervisory unions I think are doing that. I'm unclear about Orleans Southwest, but we do have um, staff who come from places that are not doing five day a week. So that that's a concern. Um, you know, the idea of floating around of, you know, is, is there's room in the school to have a daycare option, maybe for those staff or whatever. And we don't have any extra room in any of our schools. We are, are just maxed out, especially if we have to think about um, physical distancing and using our spaces differently. So, um, you know, that, that staffing is, is going to be a concern. We have not gotten leave requests yet, but as reopening plans start to emerge, I think we, we might get, so we're anticipating getting some of those. Um, mm -hmm. The other concern we have, of course, is finances and what might get clawed back to help address the ed fund deficit. Um, how will that impact us? Lots of concern about FY22 finances for sure. We're, we're just looking at leveraging the grant funds we have available to the best of our ability to try to mitigate all of those things um, without impacting student learning. You know, I know We've had teachers reach out with great ideas. I know our educators. I know they'll step up. I know, I know they'll work with us to, to make this happen. That being said, um, high levels of anxiety around um, health and safety, and, and we just need to make sure we're following those guidelines. Um, you know, the other, the other context in the Northeast Kingdom is really low numbers. You know, all of my schools are in Orleans County. We've been at 14 cases for months now, so probably no active cases. 
our community, it, it, many people in our community um, have a kind of a different view of, of this whole thing. And uh, I guess we'll see once kids come back. Uh, we're keeping a close eye on, on summer camps that are up and running and active in summer school. We don't have summer school programs in our um, SU. We never have um, other than extended year services for uh, special ed kids. But you know, we're keeping a close eye on that in contact with that. We're not seeing anything yet come out of that, but but we know that things can change and, and our educators have, we are setting them up in case we have to go full remote. Everybody has a Google Classroom. Um, it, we have early release days monthly where grade level teams meet. We've done that for years and years. They're used to doing that. It's being done virtually. You know, it was done virtually all spring. We'll continue that so they can collaborate. Um, you know, I, it's just the, the thousands of, of details and every single time you make a decision, it impacts so many other things. Exactly, and we are, you know, I, I wanna make sure we have time for the other two superintendents. And I, I, I think that we're, we're also hearing that all of you have issues around um, staffing. All of you have issues around uh, childcare issues for staff. Um, all of you have uh, HR concerns and all of you have the complexity of uh, different models of instruction. But I wanna make sure that we um, have time for the other two and maybe a little bit of time for, for questions. Um, so I would like to move on to, to um, Libby Bonesteel, superintendent of Mont Montpelier Roxbury. Hi everybody. Yep, I'm Libby Bonesteel, superintendent of Montpelier Roxbury. Um, I'll, I can go quickly through our plan. I know that's what I was asked to bring here, but it's very similar to Bev's, which is amazing because Bev and I don't know each other very well, but we are also opening five days a week, um, K through eight. We're doing a pod model. So we're putting two adults in every classroom K-8 that stay with that classroom. So we're using all available staff in order to do that. The, the teachers will not move out of those pods and the kids won't move out of those pods. So we're, we're trying to mitigate risk as much as possible in our, in our K-8 buildings that way. It's a, it's a model that was used successfully in, in Europe. Um, and so we're really relying on that model heavily. We also have a shortened day in K-8. Our students will be picked up at one o'clock um, simply because I don't think it's ethical to have kids and teachers working hard in mass all day long. Um, so we're leaving, we're having a shortened day every day for our K-8. We also have a K-8 virtual academy option for, for parents. Right now we have the survey out for parents. We have 17% and it's holding pretty steady at 17% of our parents who want that option. Um, so we're expecting about 150 students taking the virtual option across our K-12 district. Probably about 40 of those will be high school and we'll also be working with Vermont Virtual Learning Collaborative. Um, to offer that to our high schoolers. However, our K-8, we might be using uh, the Vermont Virtual Collaborative for seven and eight as well, but um, we're creating a virtual academy. Mike Berry, my director of curriculum and technology is the named principal of that. Um, you're more than welcome to visit our website. We have a lot of information on our virtual academy up on our website currently. Uh, we will be, once we have our numbers and our grade bands and the number of IEPs, um, and all of, and 504s and needs and things like that, then we'll be looking at what staffing we need from, for, from our other staff in order to staff that. Um, and then our 912 school, uh, the schedule hasn't been published yet. It's published tomorrow, but it will be a hybrid schedule. We also walk through every single space in our, in our district and our, our elementary schools and our middle school can house all kids with six feet apart. I mean, we literally built the rooms with desks to make sure. Um, our middle school, we have to change some of the spaces around a little bit, but uh, for the most part, we can fit kids. Uh, at our high school, we can only fit 13 kids in a class. All the classes are pretty uniformly shaped. And so we can only fit 13 kids and most of our classes have between 20 and 25 kids in it. So what the high school is doing is they've, they're creating a four quarter system. So we're splitting our year into four quarters. Each kid will take two classes per quarter um, and the teachers will break that class into two cohorts. So there'll be an AM cohort and a PM cohort. Kids will be attending in person four days a week for either the AM or PM session. 
And then on Wednesday, there will be a virtual learning session for the entire class with the teacher. So to bring the entire class together. Um, so doing it this way, we don't have we don't have to limit course selection to our students. They can still take their full eight course load. And it also actually opens up the schedule for a whole lot more enrichment opportunities and intervention opportunities for kids, also opportunities for a full class for SAT prep. Um, it offers AP opportunities for kids to do that longer throughout the year. It enables us to do some pre-teaching and some cross-disciplinary teaching. Uh, so we're actually pretty excited about our high school model. We hope our community is as well. <laughs> it goes out tomorrow, so cross your fingers for me. Um, I can imagine I'll be on email most of the weekend again. Um, so that's that's the Jimmy, that's the, the basics of our plan that I'm happy to answer any questions about. Uh, we've been working really closely as an administrative team. I don't know how Bev's doing it without her administrative team. I can't imagine. Um, and Chris, who you heard from earlier from Main Street Middle School is my new best friend. So we are together quite a bit with our union leadership. We're together quite a bit with our nurses. And basically we have the rule now in our district that if your eyebrows start to be raised because you're concerned, then let's talk about it. Let's talk about it and let's get it out on the table and let's try to problem solve together. So far that's worked. Um, however, I'm not gonna deny that there are several challenges that we are still attempting to overcome. I'll just give you a little hint because we haven't really talked about the now longer in-service time that we have, which I'm very thankful for. Um, we're gonna be doing virtual teaching and learning in-service training for all of our teachers, not just our virtual academy teachers. A lot on social emotional learning. We already have two days of parent conferences planned um, in order to get a sense of how that closure period was for students that was already well in our plans. Um, uh, we have to do tons of training on structure. I'm gonna book um, a consultant named Jennifer Abrams hopefully to do a session on how to have hard conversations because we're gonna have to have them and we simply can't have anybody running to a principal saying so-and-so didn't wear their mask for five minutes and I felt uncomfortable. We have to be able to say that to each other. So I'm gonna book some time to to talk about how do we have those hard conversations with each other as a staff. I'm also gonna be booking a woman named Tina Bogren to make my staff feel good. She does a lot of self-care and things. So we need, to, we need to really get them in a good position to come in knowing they can do this. Um, we'll have tons of collective uh, planning blocks. Our special educators will need to meet with every single student who has an IEP in order to rewrite that IEP and service page. So they'll have time to do that. Um, we'll have to figure out how to do the health checks and all that kind of thing. So we have a laundry list of things. And so that time, I just want legislatures to understand will be put to very good use. Um, and we're already thinking about what that's going to be like. Uh, our communication plan is I communicate every Thursday. If you're interested in any of those communications, you can find it on our website. And then the principals follow up with a more specific building spe building based communication on Monday from what I've said on Thursday. We also uh, take themes from all the questions that we get from my Thursday letters to, to the faculty or to the community and make FAQ documents off of it that can go out on Monday to try to get some of those questions answered. Uh, I, we started, we just started this week weekly town halls with our staff to make sure that they can ask any questions they want. Um, and they also shoot me emails all the time. So we, we're at communicating that way. Next week, we're starting town halls with our community. Um, we've done an ORCA broadcast show with a local resident answering questions that he took from the community and our board meetings every other week, of course, have a major update. So we have a pretty strong, robust communication plan and also all our social media sites that you can find it at MRPSVT. Um, I just want to, I would rather spend most time on my time on uh, just the challenges that we're facing right now and Representative Webb, you really, you summarized them um, nicely before I started talking and you're really hitting the nail right on the head. Um, staffing is a considerable concern right now. Um, yes, we have a childcare dilemma because we all opened with very different plans. Um, recognizing the Champlain Valley all went together that still doesn't eliminate the childcare needs, right? It's, it's a reality that we all are facing right now. I think it could have been avoided. However, it's where we are now. So um, as superintendents, it's now our job to solve the entire state's childcare need. That is a large lift and it's not anything we we've signed up for. Um, and it's been our responsibility since March. Um, so that is a major concern 
from the superintendent's group. Uh, uh, we're trying to do creative solutions in Montpelier Roxbury. We've talked about it collectively for about four hours this week already. I have a staff survey out to find out exactly who is having trouble with childcare. Um, we have about 40% back who, who say they have a major childcare issue coming up. And if you think about my district in Montpelier and Roxbury, our staff commutes from an hour circle around us. So that encompasses 20 to 25 different districts with 20 to 25 different plans. So I'm, I will make a unique bargain with each and every one of those superintendents if I have to. Um, however, that is, that's a big ask. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put that out there. Um, we also did a survey around high risk with staff. 50% of my staff falls within the category of being high risk or higher risk for COVID-19 or who lives with somebody who is at a higher risk for COVID-19. Uh, so how do we handle that? Not all of them want to work remotely, um, that's a given. However, I feel I have an ethical responsibility to protect my staff members. Um, and I also have an ethical responsibility to teach children. And so those two things are in significant conflict with each other right now. Um, because I have a survey out to my families around who's taking that in-person versus virtual and set only 17% want the virtual option. I have more staff members and not licensed in the correct fashion um, to address that need. Uh, so I'm not, I haven't solved that problem yet, but we, were, we are working very hard on figuring that part out. Um, there's anxiety. Uh, we, we are just in general around this whole piece that other people have spoken to before. And as I said today in my meeting with union leaders and nurses and administrators, let's figure out how, what we can do now to start trying to alleviate that anxiety. And really the room was silent. We don't know what we can do besides communicating more and giving opportunities for people to talk to us about it. Um, the other big concern is the, the, these questions around what happens when somebody gets sick. Again, we talked about it this morning. The, the symptoms for COVID-19 are symptoms that children have all the time. And so like, are we to assume that every time a kid has diarrhea that they now have COVID-19 because that's the biggest symptom of COVID-19 in children right now. I'm, I'm, I'm a parent of a 12 and a nine year old. It happens often. So <laughs> I'm just, I real that's a really tricky wicket. And so we have one isolation room. Our nurses today were reporting on an average typical year. They could have five to 10 children at any one time with a fever or one of those symptoms of COVID-19. So do we get five to 10 isolation rooms? Do we put them outside? That's not gonna work in January. Um, so I, we really have a struggle there with like the, I understand the safety guidance, but when it's put in reality in a school building, it's just not realistic. And so we have a major challenge. The other piece that we're talking about is when one of us, and it doesn't have to be me, it could be Lynn, who is so far away from me, has a confirmed case in their school building, either by a child or an adult. I understand what the pediatricians are saying around, you know, you might go, you might go remote for a little while and clean the space for 24 hours and then everybody can come back in. That's not the reality. We do not work in a hospital setting. We're not a pediatrician setting. We don't have doctors. We weren't trained for this kind of thing. If there's one case in a school, the reality is that there's going to be considerable pressure. And when I say pressure, I mean hate mail and I mean nastiness coming at us saying, you need to close your schools immediately for the, for the future. That, that's just the reality of things. Um, because we don't work in doctor's offices and the pediatricians that are talking to our, to our staff right now are talking in the position that they, they would take in a doctor's office. That's not us. This is a considerable problem and it's our reality. If there is a confirmed case in schools, I understand what the science is and I understand what the doctors are saying and so do all my teachers. The reality is that we will most likely have to go virtual completely again. And it doesn't matter where it happens in the state. And I think Randy's experience with the, um, with the blow up in Manchester that wasn't actually a blow up is a good case in point. So that's, that's a piece that I think we all need to be thinking about. Um, the guidance, whether or not it's shifting or coming when it needed or whatever, it's, that is what it is. And I think most of us are pretty, pretty there. I mean, we're just dealing with it as it's coming. 
Um, we do need special education guidance and I do recognize how technical that is, um, but that is a major concern for a lot of my educators and a lot of my parents that I can't answer yet. Um, and I, I, under, I get Secretary French, that it's a tough technical thing that you, that's not easy to write in any way, shape or form. And we understand that. Um, we also need some work on pre-K. I'm not sure what that's supposed to look like yet. We also have staffing dilemmas in that area because pre-K teachers are not easy to find. And so I have a pre-K teacher who is saying, I'm not coming to work. And so now I have a pre-K that I need to find a teacher for, and I probably won't be able to. So am I allowed to cancel pre-K? I don't know yet. So we'll, we'll see about that. Um, I also have other staffing concerns at, at RVS in particular. It's my smallest school. It has 35 kids in it. We need a one-two teacher. We have no nurse there. Um, we can't hire a nurse. We've had it on the books to, for in school spring for at least five months now. Can't hire one. Um, we have a, more than half our staff fall in the, at ri the high risk category at RVS, um, which is a major concern. So I'm not positive about what we do with that yet. I haven't solved that problem yet. Um, outdoor, go ahead. Cause I wanna make sure we have time for, for our brand as well. Um, can you tell me when you think you will have an understanding as to what your staffing issues are? Um, I think I have a pretty good understanding now. <laughs> uh, however, we haven't we haven't figured out how with our union how we're going to staff the virtual academy yet. And I think once those decisions are made, which they should be made by hopefully the end of next week, if not midway through the week after that. Once people know what our reality is with what we need for the virtual academy and what the reality is of what we need for in person, I fully expect resignations to come at me. And this is something that is a statewide issue from what I'm hearing. I believe so. I don't want to speak for my other superintendent colleagues, but I believe it is. Yeah, we're hearing it, hearing it statewide. So did, did you have just one more thing? Before? Yeah, I, just my last, my my last two quick things is outdoor education. I'm getting a lot of pressure for outdoor education. People think you can just put up farmers tents, farmers markets tents and everything's gonna be fine and get them outside, but there's a liability issue there and a considerable cost. And I'm a pretty much a city school district. So I don't have space for that. And that understanding is hard. And then the last thing I wanna say is that my colleagues of superintendents around the state are the smartest, most dedicated people I know. And I've never seen a more beat up group of people. We are tough and we can take a whole lot of things, but we're taking things left and right and it's really hard right now. So that's it. Yeah. Well, that sounds easy. <laughs> so, well, thank you very much, uh, Libby. I, I always enjoy hearing from you. And if you can stay um, and if we have time, I, I do wanna get Barbara Ann um, as well, who has stayed here since two, <laughs> as have you. So Barbara Ann, if you are available. Yes, um, Madam Chair and members of the House Education Committee. My name is Barbara Ann Commons Montrell. I am superintendent of Wyndham Southwest Supervisor Union. It is in south, Southern Vermont. And it is pretty much between Bennington and Brattleboro. Um, I have five schools and about 600 students. I'm also president of the Southeast Regional Superintendents Association. And it is a privilege to be speaking in front of you. I realize that you are at the end of your timing. I know that a lot has already been said. Um, Representative Webb, is there a time frame? I want to really honor that you want the time for questions, and you're pretty much got, almost there. I've got about um, 12 minutes. Okay. And we'll see what we can do. And I, I might, if people are willing to stay on a little bit longer, I, I, I think I would like to do that and extend us to 515 for those of us that can, can, can stay. Very good. So in response to COVID, we created a Wyndham Southwest COVID task force. And our task force team is made up of principals and central office administrators. And we have been meeting sometimes daily, then sometimes weekly, depending on what is coming up for us. We've been working long and hard. And one of the first things that we did was we studied the uh, safe and health guidance for reopening schools that came out from the AOE and Department of Health. And from that, we created a version of that in very user-friendly language, and it is our Self and Healthy Schools Reopening of Schools plan. Um, we have some guiding principles that guide this work, including that document. Um, the safety and health of all students and staff is a priority. Um, and social-emotional learning and health 
of students and staff is also critical. In-person education is preferred mode while we need to be prepared for distance learning and equity of access must be front and center. You've heard these, but it is really important to just to mention that it is during a crisis that equity issues do get highlighted and we are quite aware of those. Um, that document was widespread, it was shared, and we believe strongly in collaboration and communication. And so part of that plan has included our sharing that with our staff and teachers, getting a full day of input, sharing it with our boards. I have a super board, which includes all of our board members, sharing it with all of them, getting input, then making adjustments, and then putting it out to the community. When we put it out to the community, we put out a survey so they could give us input at that stage. That has been a very vital piece to keep the communication lines open so people feel a part of this process. And that has been going well. Um, we are at the stage where we are having a, it's every day this week, we have a community meeting at each of our schools. And we're having people show up where they could talk with myself and the principals and ask their questions. That has been well received as well. What we're working on right now is our reopening of schools part two. And that is either you call it the learning dispositions or models for schooling. And we identified that the survey information that we received from parents that included that 59% of the people do plan to send their children back, but that is about 41% that do not. Um, and then we got about 70% that are interested in knowing more about a remote learning option. That spoke to us very strongly, that is an interest. So that along with three other key premises that we need to prepare and train to transition to remote learning at the turn of a dime. We just need that flexibility and that agility. We also, again, believe strongly students need to be in school and we use uh, the guidance documents to lead everything that we're doing. With that, we identified that we're going to have two options for families. These are in a proposal mode. They are going in front of the super board actually tonight for them to discuss it further. The two options that we're proposing, one is a four day in person with one day remote. The four day in person pretty much is a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. It is for K through 12. Uh, we did prioritize pre-K five based on the guidance and information that we did receive from the AOE as well as from other research and pediatricians. We also believe that if we could fit the children, which is the case, we can fit the children in all our schools. And because our numbers are small, we can follow all those guidelines and still open. The choice to have it be four days versus five is the value of having one day for teachers to provide remote learning skills and to have them practice, build their competency in it, have the children practice it. And also we want the time to give students with specialized needs time in the building where no one else is there. So for those reasons, we're proposing that Wednesdays not be in person. Uh, we understand that that could be a hardship for some families. We've been collaborating with our 21C program called WINGS to come up with a proposal that Wednesdays would, would have some level of childcare for those families who definitely need that. Additionally, based on that survey that I mentioned earlier, with 70% interested in knowing more about the remote learning option, we also are proposing a fully remote learning option, which would be a completely separate track than this other hybrid 4-1 model. And this is where parents can choose this. And we're looking closely at collaborating with the Vermont Virtual Learning Collaborative to do that work with them. We still need a lot more planning time to figure all that out. One of the pieces that comes up is this which comes first, the chicken or the egg? We have to figure out who do we have to staff, how many children need that. And that work is going to hopefully come to us, that information will come to us through some more surveys that we'll be sending out. There are a few items that I'm going to reiterate that you've already summarized. I've heard from other superintendents here, as well as Chair Webb, you've summarized it very well. These are some of the concerns and things that we'd like to bring in front of you coming from the Southeast Regional Superintendents. 
One of them is around the expenses. They're, they're high. We have a lot of small schools and a lot of our small schools only have part-time nurses, part-time custodians, but that's not feasible with all these needs. So we need full-time nursing and full-time custodians. That costs money. We also are having also similar challenges in finding nursing uh, staff. Um, there's also concerns that everybody shares around fiscal year 22 and about what, how much money would be clawed back. Can we really spend money that we're being told we can spend through these grants or do we really need to try not to? So that, that's a worry. Um, again, repeating what other people have said, but it's important for you to hear is the uh, waiving of some days from 175 to 170. That's waiving the student days. That's really helpful. And for you to consider um, holding no harm to the ADM, that's the annual daily membership, protecting that. We do have people interested in homeschooling and that losing the people, whether it's to homeschooling or something else will impact us. Please do consider that. Um, Childcare, you've heard a lot of those issues, uh, the issues for parents and for teachers. Um, lots of questions about labor, workforce, staffing. You've heard a lot of that as well. Um, testing. The question about, is there some way that we could ensure there is a system um, for testing? It's coming up by the community and staff. And then lastly, the one I wanted to mention is one that I know Libby mentioned, but I wanna emphasize the decision-making process for when we need to close. That is an extremely challenging process. It will be filled with anxiety and fear and pressure from the community. There needs to be more guidance around how to do that to support superintendents around making those decisions. And to not underestimate that the pressure of the community will start prevailing and that will start leading to schools closing, even when there's rumors, even when it's just about someone they know versus even someone that they've had close contact with. While the health guidance is clear, not everybody follows that when they're in anxiety and in some level of trauma. So please keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have a couple of questions. I have one quick one to, first to, to Dan French, uh, just around the CRF funds and HVAC. Uh, do we have, just if you could just give us a quick update, are those funds coming out yet? Uh, not yet, probably next week. It's a little more elaborate process due to, uh, you know, the involvement of uh, the oversight of the CRF funds and the bureaucracy. So it's taking a little longer, I hope, but it should be out next week. Which bureaucracy? Uh, we have our own, the finance office, and then joint fiscal committee's interest in making sure the funds are used appropriately. You know, these are fairly restrictive, so we're, we're making sure everything's done properly, of course. Uh, we're basically submitting uh, questionnaires on each program aspect to ensure compliance. We just received approval for the food service program elements, and I think we're very close to having the larger pot of money approved uh, for the general reimbursement for schools. So it's just taken a little longer internally than I thought it would. Okay, thank you, um, Larry Cooperly, and then Peter Conlon. And we'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold this open another 15 minutes um, for for those that that can stay. Um, it, it's very clear that we have some, some real anxiety and the anxiety is, it, it's based in some real concerns. And I think the best we can do in the legislature, in the administration, in the field is to work to identify those issues that are driving that anxiety and see if we can systematically address, address the ones that we can. Remembering that at all times, the virus rules. And uh, that they're, not a, they're not an easy dance partner as we go through this. Um, Larry Coopley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think, Libby, you had brought up a, a pretty frightening aspect of perhaps teachers who do not want to come back to the classroom. And uh, <clears throat> Don is not with us, but Jeff, I think you're here with us, I hope. Jeff Fannin, you still on? But my, you know, my concern is, you know, either because of age or- Yes, maybe, I'm still here. Okay. I'm still here. Some of the teachers, because of age or health compromised conditions, 
may not want to be in the classrooms. And my concern is, do they take a leave of absence? And how do you handle their compensation? Um, should that occur? This so, is so, oh, go ahead. This is a conversation that every superintendent is having with their school board and legal currently. Um, because how do you how do you deal with that? If I if I offer but this is a if because we haven't figured it out. If I offer a year's leave without pay or with pay, it doesn't matter. If I offer a year's pay, I have to replace that teacher. It's That's not correct. like I have an abundance of teachers who are just waiting to work. Um, so I have to replace that teacher. I don't, it's hard to hire a teacher right now. Um, I don't know if I could do it. I had to have a much easier chance of doing it than Lynn would or Bev would, but it really, like that is amazing. So we don't know what to do with that. Jeff, can you help a little bit? Uh, it, it is a, a major issue. We, we've been aware about aware of it for some time uh, and trying to get a handle on it. It's sort of a chicken and the egg. The problem is we didn't have plans, so people didn't know whether they were coming back or not. Jeff, could you just asked, Jeff, could you just state um, who you are in your role? Who you I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Jeff Bannon, Vermont and EA. Um, the, the trouble that the concern has long been known, I would say. The challenge has been the plans are just recently out. And then I think, I don't know who it was. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a visual right now who was testifying and said, you know, once the plans come out, then, then she would be getting possible resignations or other people assessing. And so it's sort of the chicken, and the egg, they weren't able, the superintendents weren't able to know who was coming back to develop plans. People weren't able to determine whether they were willing to come back until they knew what the plans were, right? If they were going to go remote, it looks different than in person and everybody's situation is different and everybody's covered or not under the ADA. So it's, it's a, what we, you know, that was why a couple, you know, a month or so ago, we've been calling for a statewide commission uh, to address these and other issues. We're, we're working on it at a state level now, but that is truly why you know, we thought this was a state issue a month or month and a half ago. Um, and we're, we're working on it, but it, I don't have an answer for you, uh, Representative Coopley, entirely. It's work in progress, I will say that. We know it's time is of the essence. So if a teacher does not come back, Jeff, if they decide on, you know, they just don't want to come back to the classroom for obvious reasons, um, do they still, are they still compensated by their supervisory union or their local district, their school district? Well, it, you know, each situation is different. I, I think the answer is generally no. If you're not working, you're not getting paid. Now, there may be some benefits that uh, I'm not aware of. You know, there might be a contract that says if you, you know, you, you, you take some of your sick leave with you or something like that. But those are just benefits that they typically would get. There's nothing special that I'm aware of. If you're not working, you're not getting paid. That's pretty typical and normal. Uh, a lot of people are close to retirement and might take a retirement, they might go the retirement route and just take a lesser amount because they're going to work maybe two more years or something like that and said, the heck with it, I'm going to retire now and I'll just take a lower annuity kind of thing. Thank you. So th those are the, I mean, those are the people, the questions people are grappling with right now with their spouses, with their family members and, and, you know, amongst themselves and with their superintendents, frankly, they've all been trying to work together. I, I know to figure out who's going to stay, who's going to be there. And who just says, I can't, because physically I cannot do it, I shouldn't do it, or my spouse is at risk and I shouldn't do it for that reason, or, you know, any number of reasons why. It's, it's a health crisis. It's not an academic crisis. It's not an education crisis. And Understand. unfortunately, it's still spilling over into the education realm. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I think Peter Conlon. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, uh, just a, a quick comment on the question. And the, the comment is in reaction to uh, Libby Bonesteel's uh, comment about superintendents being a fairly beat up bunch right now. It's not surprising um, you're, you're tasked with coming up with the right answers for a number of constituencies, children, teachers, staff, parents, the community. 
uh, in an era where there really no one really knows what the right answer is, and in an era where you're um, really working under guidance and not mandates to fall back on. Um, and I just want to say that despite all of that, the level of um, new cooperation and collaboration uh, that's going on across the state is, is impressive, and the work that has resulted from that is incredibly impressive. Uh, so I just want to want to put that out there that given the fact that, you know, as we keep saying, you're, you're building the plane in flight. Um, uh, it's, it's amazing and impressive work. Uh, my question is really for any of the three uh, superintendents we've had this afternoon, all three of you are going with a, a much more in-person uh, model for K-8 students um, starting in the fall. And this goes to the question of what if somebody gets sick? Um, because you're using that model, uh, how uh, nimble will you be in terms of pivoting to uh, fully remote if, if the need comes up? Uh, I can take that one, Brian or Bev, if you want to jump in too. Um, the, uh, we fully expect to be able to pivot rather quickly. So if we have to go fully re remote, we will. The beauty of having the virtual academy up and running from the get-go and having that principal who really knows what he's doing, Mike Berry is excellent at what he does and knows the realm of technology really well, is that now we'll have a cadre of, of teachers, of professionals who will have worked out lots of kinks. We also have a really strong professional learning community in our district, um, and I know others do as well. So those virtual teachers will still be meeting, albeit virtually, with their in-person colleagues through a professional learning community. Um, so they'll still be lockstep with what's happening there. Um, and so we, we fully expect that the turnaround to go virtual when we have to do it, it's more of a when, not an if, um, will be relatively <laughs> easy <laughs> um, compared to last spring. It will be a different experience than last spring. Um, Representative Coopley, is your hand still up? If you are, if you have something, no, you're good. I, I just put my hand down. Okay, thank you. I just want so much to thank um, folks coming in today, in whatever that means, coming to this meeting today to help inform the House Education Committee on uh, where you are in terms of the guidance from the agency connection to the field and how the field is implementing that guidance as well as a complex array of learning models. Um, it's very clear that there are some unanswered questions at this time. I hear some that are coming toward us that I'm pretty sure we can address, if not in August, in January. I'm hearing questions about the number of days, the ADM count, the calendar. I think I might have heard something about licensing. I'm not sure. Um, there's also a question I'm hearing in relation to um, Perhaps some of the things that the agency can do in terms of purchasing of materials on a broader scale and making those available. Um, and this is not a conversation that's over. Um, I am so appreciative of you all for what you're doing. And I, I really think that Representative Conlon um, stated it well, that uh, even though we hear about the upset and the worry and the concern we, that's there, we're also seeing that there are people that are very actively working to address those conditions. So I think it's important that we have access to both, both the challenges as well as the work that is being done. Um, we will be meeting again in August. Um, there will be some CRF funds that we will be looking at as to how those will be used. Um, I am appreciative of the issues that you brought forward to us today, and I'm also very aware of your concerns about um, clawback. Um, I guess with that, I, I just want to thank everyone and um, thank you, uh, Secretary French, for, for coming in and, and as well as um, Lynn Coda and Randy Lowe, Bev Davis, Liberty Bonesteel, and Barbara Ann. Commons Montreal, our superintendents, 
um, and our teachers who are were able to stay, Chris Garros and, and Andrea Griffin, uh, you're my heroes because no matter what we do, you're carrying it out. Even if you have no instruction, you're gonna figure it out. You're my heroes. Um, and I guess with that, uh, we can end. Thank you.